Welcome everyone to the Dean's Den, our webinar all about embedding experiential learning across the business school. Just before we, we get started, uh, just to sort of say that, well, a few uh, sort of housekeeping parts really, which I'm sure you're used to hearing when you join these sorts of webinars, but we are recording the session. So please be aware that, um, yeah, we are recording it, but that's really so that we can provide you afterwards with a copy of the recording link in case you want to recap on anything. But also, of course, for anyone who signed up and wasn't able to make it today. Um, if you have any questions, please put your questions in the chat. We'll try to respond to those as we go on uh, to sort of build those questions into the conversation. But we will also be building in some time towards the end of the session uh, for a sort of dedicated question and answer session as well. So um, feel free to keep your questions to the end or as you go. And uh, my colleague Milo Hendricks will also be uh, sort of responding in the chat uh, as well if if you know if it looks like we can just answer your question very quickly so we'll get we'll get started then uh, but just a reminder if you can try and keep your your microphones muted and your cameras muted as well that would be great so as you know we've done a number of these webinars over the course of 2021 um, I've hosted I think well we've tried to do one I think once every couple of months and it's been really really successful this is the first one of a new series of webinars which we're calling the Dean's Den so the idea now is to sort of build upon the foundations of uh, webinars we've, we've already done around experiential learning gamification using management simulations but this time thinking about it in more of a holistic way in terms of how we will take a sort of high level view of embedding experiential learning across the business school. So some of the topics that we'll be talking about today uh, with our guest speaker, which we're delighted to welcome, by the way, um, welcome Charles, by the way, uh, Associate Dean, uh, Academic uh, Student Experience at the University of Salford. Actually, Charles, before I um, maybe go through some of these topics and then I'll do an intro on Edumundo as well, before we get into the conversation, Perhaps if you just want to make, maybe take a moment to introduce yourself, if you like. Uh, hello, I'm Charles Knight. I'm the uh, Associate Dean Academic Student Experience and Business School. Um, as we go through the session a bit later, do please put me on the spot with um, hard questions. I'll, I'll, when we get into the conversation, um, I'll get into quite a bit of detail of the context of the school and how uh, the work we've done with Ed Mundo fits with the overall philosophy that we have in the school. Uh, I'm very fortunate to work for a very forward-looking dean, very innovative dean, and I'll talk about that a bit more later. So as we go through, if there's anything that you, you, you would like to ask about kind of how you would embed this kind of thing in your own context, please do ask in the chat and we'll try and answer it. That's great. Thank you, Charles. And yeah, in terms of some of the things we're hoping to cover today, um, it's going to be great to get, to get in the conversation with you, by the way, and we're really, really pleased to have you. But what we're going to hopefully be talking about broadly is, well, strategic aims of using business simulations across the business school, thinking about actually how we, you know, some of the considerations to have a sort of holistic view of this across the business school as well. So in terms of all the different stakeholders that need to be brought into this, um, thinking around the curriculum as well. So, you know, not just a simulation as an afterthought and a bolt on, but really from the outset, simulation sort of being central to the uh, to the learning and then well success of course like with any big project we need to demonstrate efficacy so what data we can call upon to really show that things are working um, and then we'll be talking a little bit about a partnership approach and specifically um, what we've been doing at, at Salford as well okay well it, we always find it's quite uh, beneficial to just give a little bit of a background in Edumundo and well what we're all about and our approach to simulations and by the way, please, could I just remind anyone who's joining a little bit late just to keep your uh, cameras uh, muted if you, if you can and your, uh, your microphones as well. Thank you. OK, so a little bit about us, just a few minutes. So, well, we've been operating for 20 years, uh, so since 2001, developing management simulations. Uh, so we have a huge amount of expertise in this. It's what we do. We have since sort of geared off into other uh, product lines, but that's still really the core focus of what we do. We have around 40 employees, most of whom are based uh, in our head headquarters in The Hague, but well, we have some who are based like me in the UK and uh, in other parts of the world too. We're truly a global company, so we're working with over 300 universities worldwide and in countries, well, actually we're active in all continents of the world. But in the UK, that's around 40 plus institutions 
a mixture of post-92 and Russell Group institutions. And in fact, we, we work with uh, 19 universities in the UK that have the, um, sorry, 19 universities which have business schools, which have the, uh, the highly regarded triple accredited status as well. Um, we also work with, with the private sector too. So we work with around um, well, a really high number of corporates supporting their leadership development programs. And in some cases, their talent acquisition programs too. And as you can imagine, well, that's a, a really large number of students we're working with each year. So in terms of our management simulations, we have a very large portfolio of these. And there are some commonalities. So just to sort of say they're all web-based, they'll work on any device. Uh, you can access them on your smartphone if you like, uh, but of course, it's advisable to have a big screen where possible. Typically, it works like this, that students will be put into teams and they'll take over an existing company a virtual company, of course, within the simulation, and they will be the new owners of that company, managing the company across a, a number of rounds, uh, which are mapped to each week of study within the semester, uh, each round or week representing one year of operations in the simulation. The time investment is quite flexible, depending on how much time you have available, uh, and it's customizable, of course, as well. Uh, but importantly, our simulations are all really competitive. So the dynamic nature of the algorithm means that you're not just competing against a computer, but you're directly competing against the other student teams. So where one team perhaps gains some market share and, and, and takes that, they, they, you know, they, they'll directly take that from their competitors. Um, yeah, sorry, you can hear my dog barking in the background, I think. So uh, sorry about that, but he's, uh, he's just making himself heard. Okay, well, we also cater for all student levels as well. So um, actually from foundation right through to level seven uh, in the UK. And well, our simulations are highly flexible as well. Uh, well, these are some of the high level things that we often see from using the simulations, but actually this is exactly what we're gonna uh, hopefully hear from you, Charles, as well about is, you know, what is the high level reasons to use a management simulation uh, across the business school? But typically we'll, you know, it's things like uh, engagement, uh, improving the sort of student experience and satisfaction, continuation rates, completion rates, uh, and of course, graduate outcomes. So, well, this is the last slide I'm gonna show for now before we get into the conversation, but just to sort of say that we, have such a, a broad portfolio of simulations and even within the ones that we do have we can tailor them further towards uh, specific subjects as well so on the right here you can see a list of the sorts of common uh, modules that we'll often work with uh, we'll often have a simulation deployed in so as you can see quite a broad uh, focus there okay well charles great to Hello. see you and thanks for thanks for joining uh, no problem. So we were delighted to get your, your thoughts on this webinar because, well, as you know, we've held a series of these webinars and usually we'll get uh, an academic who's actually using a simulation on their module. So it's more specific, I suppose, to the individual module leader or lecturer um, sort of needs and issues. But we thought it, oh, and it was it's great, of course, that you agreed to be part of this because I know, although you're not using a simulation in your teaching as such, uh, you are you were of course central to um, you know in, to to embedding simulations across uh, Salford Business School. So, I mean, perhaps it'd be good just to give us a little bit of a background sure. on yeah your thoughts around that and and why why you even looked at that as an approach to start with. I suppose yeah. So uh, for the audience, um, I always like to make sure that people go away with practical things that they can do. So, if you've got a pen, keep it handy, um, and you will have the recording later. So I joined Salford Business School two years ago, uh, and I was part of a new management team um, run by our dean, Dr. Janice Allen. And I mentioned earlier, Janice is a very forward-looking dean. She's a very innovative dean. Uh, and the thing, I think the key thing before we get into the kind of detail of what we did, um, it's really important to note that everything that we do in the business school links back to what our core mission is in the school and how we outline that to students, because depending on where you are from in the world, you will have different regulatory challenges. And so we're really careful to think about what's the promise we articulate to our students and how do we live up to that promise? And so our Dean, uh, Janice Allen, who I've mentioned, 
she actually led a very detailed and lengthy cultural debate we had in the school about who are we, what do we do, why, and how do we translate this into a clear articulation to our students? Because that's really important both for recruitment purposes and also for student satisfaction as they move through the university. And so we had this really interesting debate in school about what does that mean pedagogically for teaching and learning? And then how do we work with partners such as Edmundo to make that happen? So in brief, what we promise within the business school and the business school, we're based in Salford. Um, the, the school is a faculty, really. It covers all the areas you'd expect of business and management. We've got digital business. We've got economics. We also, within the business school, we have a law school. So we cover the, a, a wide range of activities and we go from uh, undergraduate degrees all the way through to PhD. And so when we had this cultural conversation that the dean led, um, what we decided was that for our taught students, we wanted students to have what we call a deep learning experience, where at each level of their study, they'd have opportunities to work with industry, to expand their knowledge and experience. But we also wanted that undergraduate and postgraduate experience to be underpinned by extensive use of data-driven simulations, hence our partnership with Edmundo, and, ex and, and immersive experiences. So the work that we're currently doing with Edmundo on simulations is not a bolt-on, and I think that's really important. It's part of a core philosophy that we have in the school. And interestingly, and I'll, I'll probably come back to this later, interestingly, the experience we've had with Edmundo has spurred us on to think about, well, how else can we, we create data-driven simulations in the school? How else can we create kind of immersive experiences? And the reason for all of this is the promise that we make to the students is that we're very upfront with students, that our students and graduates will have developed graduate skills and attributes that are in demand by employers. And across all of that, we're trying to make sure as much as possible that there's this element of personalization. The work that we'll talk about today is part of, of making that promise real. There are all sorts of challenges with embedding simulations in a business school, and we'll get into what some of those are and how to avoid them. But overall, the, the reason we work with Edmundo is that their work is core to the promise that we came up with in the school, which is about making sure that we have this immersive experience, this deep learning experience. So, 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 and part of that, Charles, as you said, is the offer that you're making to, to students from the outset then. Mm. So what they're, what they're to expect when they come, what does it mean to come to uh, Salter Business School? Uh, what does education look like there? What will they get? And so, and so actually it's trying to almost build that in from the outset to the marketing offer to students mm. as well. Yeah, I mean, if we're, if we're um, the UK market, I know we've got an international audience, the UK market is a very highly competitive market. Uh, it's also a highly regulated marketplace. So you have to be very clear to uh, in your marketing material to potential students. You have to be very clear about what you offer. And actually, interestingly, articulating a core promise, this journey the Dean's led us on, has actually really led into that. Because when you think about how you do your marketing for prospective students, you can say, does it, does it clearly link to this articulation of the vision? Then, if we are promising students on entry that they will get these opportunities and experiences and it will develop them in these ways, then you get into, but how do we operationalize that? And so the, the, the relationship we, we have with Edmundo is really core to that operationalization. One of our promises is that students will learn from real world data and have simulation experiences that will simulate what they do in the workplace because we want to help them develop graduate skills around analytical skills, critical reasoning, the ability to make decisions and so on and so on. And so what it does mean, for example, in a recruitment event, we can articulate and visualize to them how that will, will work. People understand gaming, so they understand to an instinctive level how simulations will work. So yeah, it does, it works, it, it works, it works all the way through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think uh, th th that's a big part of it for sure. And I think we're increasingly seeing more now of, you know, student expectations 
driving strategy to a certain ex to a certain extent. Um, and well, that can take many forms, but of course, actually, the, the marketing then is is crucial because actually, if students are seeing something that they expect and something that that is more tangible, something that's going to be an opportunity for them to apply their theory, to be to have fun in the learning process, and for it to have that real world link from the outset, then it's clear that a lot of students will take that opportunity uh, in terms of driving their choice of what provision that they'd like. Yes, and and I think I think the other core thing to this, which we do we we make clear in our in our marketing, so the traditional model in the United Kingdom is um, lecture plus seminar, so a, a small seminar, and and so what we're finding in in trying to articulate our promise and make it real is to think about how does that change the nature of what we do in terms of face to face in class delivery. So if we take um, uh, the idea of simulations more generically so i won't concentrate on any one simulation what it does mean is it lends itself to thinking really carefully about how you structure that student journey through the academic year so at the university of salford we have for undergraduates two trimesters and each of those is broken into a 12-week block and so if we know we're going to use a simulation on a module we can think really carefully about but what what does that mean for the week-to-week -week delivery and something I think that's not talked about very much when people think about embedding simulations is, uh, and, and you mentioned this earlier, Leon, you've got to think really carefully about how does that embed itself into your pedagogical practice? How does it embed itself into teaching learning? Otherwise, what you may end up doing is you buy a simulation and it's a bolt on. That doesn't work in my experience. And that's not actually, we were entirely upfront with Edmundo from the start we're not interested in simulations as a kind of nice to have and a bolt on. They are core to what we do. And, and actually, we are um, currently internally discussing how we expand out our use of simulations and how we expand into the use of different types of simulations. So, yeah, it, it's got to fit all the way through. Well, that's really, uh, I think that as we're talking about that, then let's, let's go sort of down that route a little bit, because thinking about simulations as a bolt-on and taking that to its extreme mm. is, I suppose, then thinking about a simulation as like an extracurricular activity. So something that students, of course, can just yeah. choose to sign up to if they want. And as we know, and I've, I've been talking about this uh, with a few other academics recently, you know, is as we know that it, it, if students are given that choice, whilst it's nice, of course, mm. for students to have these extracurricular opportunities, sometimes it can end up... Uh, the end result can be that those students who we're trying to, to help the most can be the ones that don't end up taking advantage of those, those extracurricular opportunities. So I think that that's one extreme form. And whilst we do support a number mm. of extracurricular yeah. uh, sort of situations with simulations, our preference is always yeah. for, that, for that to be embedded within sure. uh, a learning of study and for it to have some clear link in terms of the assessment criteria. So yeah. So, yeah. so just, just to say, there's no problem with using, and we have used simulations for extracurriculum as a kind of planned activity. What I would get very nervous about for anyone on the call is if you are um, going to go down the route of embedding simulations and truly embed them. Um, at other institutions and people have had conversations with me uh, privately from other institutions say, how's it, how's it gone with simulations? They say to me, we're thinking of using a simulation. I say, great, how's that going to be embedded in? And they say, oh, don't know. We'll, we'll get one and try it and see how it works. Well, that's not actually a very productive use of your resource as an institution. And also, and I know we're going to talk about this later, what, what you really want to do is get buy-in from individual academics who are often driving this to say, okay, how is this going to make a difference? What do we need to change to, to maximise the value? And if we just go back to students for a minute, um, you mentioned about students getting the value. The University of Salford, very proudly, is a widening participation institution. Many of our students are the first generation of students to come to university. I am a graduate of the University of Salford from many years ago. I was the first member of my family to go to university. What's really nice about simulations when you use them in the correct way is what is absolutely core is we want our first generation students to develop career capital. We want that when they leave, they're in a better place to get into a good graduate level job or further study. Simulations are really nice when they're embedded properly because 
they create the opportunity for your students to develop their own agency. They're not passive recipients of knowledge. And what I mean by that in a very practical way is simulations we use with Ed Edmundo are round based and they make decisions between rounds. That's agency because you're putting the students in a situation where you're not saying to them, here's the answers. You're saying to them, OK, tell me what are the decisions you're going to make for the next round. The students then articulate to each other why they're going to make decisions they do. It helps them develop their agency. So for us, it's really good because it's a powerful way to get students who may not be used to having a voice to start thinking about how they articulate their own reasoning. So um, I, I could go on about agency all day, but it's it's as a pedagogical tool, it can be really, really powerful if embedded in the correct way. No, absolutely. And uh, well, yeah, um, and I suppose sort of extending on from agency mm. as well is, is of course self-directed self to an extent as well, although they're with their peers, so it's peer-based learning. It's also actually encouraging them to take control of their own learning and choose for themselves. Actually, you know, it's not it's not a case of this is the right answer, this mm. is the wrong answer. It's very much actually well, there is no necessarily there is not necessarily one right answer. So it's about them discussing with their teammates and trying to work out for themselves where you know the the, the right answers should be or, or why something is the right approach. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think there's there's an element of that for sure. And, um, and I think tied to that as well is, and you've mentioned this, I think for anyone on here who, who is considering the simulation route, the other thing to think really carefully about is, so you're going to embed it in your courses of study. And Leon mentioned, how is it going to be linked to the assessment? Because one of the conversations that we had with Edmundo when we went down this road was, OK, if we embed simulations into this module, this module, and this module, and we thought really carefully about mapping it at different levels, so there was a different range of skills developed. Think really carefully about what does that mean for the assessment on that module? Is it going to be uh, an assessment which, for example, is more heavily reflective, where students reflect on the decisions they've made through the simulation? Is the, simula is the assessment going to take a different form? But you need to think really carefully about all of those different stages. How are we going to maximise value? Because the other side of this, which I haven't really mentioned, um, if you embed this in the correct way and it's really clear to students what's going on, then you can have very positive and powerful impacts on attendance. And when you have impacts on attendance and students attend, all of the evidence, pedagogical evidence, all the evidence we know from government bodies, the more students are to attend, the more likely they are to embed themselves to the community, the university, and the more likely they are to do well. So do, do think really carefully about how is this going to be how is this going to be through the core of this module or course depending on the language you use yeah and, and those things of course then lead back to those high level things about continuation completion and of yeah. course well graduate employment as well so it's all linked isn't it but absolutely attendance uh is, is a good starter isn't it to sort, sort, of, sort of getting towards good engagement um, i think another thing as well charles is, is actually and you mentioned Salford Business School, or Salford University, hmm. um, having quite high levels of sort of students coming from widening access, widening yes. participation backgrounds. But I suppose one of the great things about simulations as well is, in, in contrast to a sort of more traditional forms of, of learning as well, is it's helping students to make those links in terms of um, finding the relevance and the context to what the theory means, because yes. sometimes that can be quite inaccessible. For students to just come in their first, uh, you know, first weeks at university to sit in a lecture theatre and to be sort of taught this theory. Well, actually, it's working out yeah. what that means and why it's important and where it sits. So trying to find something tangible that students can relate to, I think, is really important. Absolutely. So uh, another thing that that ties to our use of simulations, which is uh, a kind of wider point that some of you may be um, thinking about at the moment, You've hit upon something actually, Leon, which is many students, when they first come to university, it's a really bewildering experience. It's a very strange place to them. If they've come in the United Kingdom from a college experience, it's a, it's a much more on rails experience in university where they're expected to have more independence. So one of the other things we've done in the business school alongside simulations, but helps to make simulations work. All of our undergraduate business and management students, when they first join us, only do now one module. 
they do one immersive module. It's a four week block module. It's the only things that they do. And the reason for this is it's to help them in a very controlled environment, make that transition into higher education and to understand the language of higher education and to understand the kind of society and culture of the university they're joining. And what that means is when they then move on to their next modules, which may involve simulations, the kind of how does university work fades into the background and they can um, get involved in the kind of things that Leon's mentioned, the kind of higher reasoning and contextual things. And the other thing I've mentioned about simulations, which I think is really interesting because I've talked to a number of students, simulations to me in a very nice way are an intellectual trap in that with some of the um, really engaged and switched on students, they really get into depth into the industry that the simulation is based around. So Edmundo has a simulation of based around the trainers market. And I've talked to some of our students who way beyond what we require in the classroom, go away and research that marketplace and the research that industry. And that's quite interesting because they'll have a conversation with you and they'll know, now know more about that industry than you do. And, and that, that to me is really powerful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, so just going to take a minute, Charles, just to sort of say, uh, well, for anyone who's late joining, uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're talking with Charles Knight here, Associate Dean Academic uh, Student Experience at the University of Salford. Um, and it's been a great conversation so far, but we're only halfway through. So uh, let's carry on with the, with, the, with the conversation. I was keen, actually, Charles, to mm. think about, yeah, coming back to assessment, I suppose, and building this into the curriculum, this experiential approach. So we were quite fortunate and it was quite refreshing actually um, for us to be able to work with, with you and, and with your colleagues from the outset, knowing that we actually had a high level buy-in in terms of being able to maybe adjust the module specifications or the learning mm. outcomes or change the assessment criteria where, where applicable to do so. So that was quite nice. Um, having said that, it's often not the case, right, where we'll, we'll, we'll often sort of come in where the module specification is already in place and, well, the assessment is already very clearly articulated as, uh, you know, for example, 50% individual reflective report, 50% group presentation or something like that. And I think what's nice about, and, and, and this links back to what you were saying about simulations not being a bolt-on, for us, whilst it's of course great to be able to come in and, mm. and, and completely refresh, you know, to, to, to yeah. be involved in the conversation from the designing stage of the, the module. What's more important is how it links back to that assessment approach there as well. So I just wondered if, yeah, if you had any yeah. more thoughts. So, on that. so, so the assessment approach, and I go back to my kind of first principles, I mentioned that I, I'll, I'll, I'll give a little um, exercise that people can try in their own institutions. So I mentioned that, the dean had, had led this change process, which was really powerful, by the way, because we would hold town halls with staff and say, this is the direction of the school. What do you think? How would you articulate this? And staff members, professional services staff, academic staff would be involved. And if you remember at the start, I said, we wanted this deep learning experience. We wanted to use data-driven simulations because the end point, we wanted students to have graduate skills and attributes that employers wanted. And one of the things we did, a really simple mapping exercise that I recommend to all of you is, if you are uh, as an institution or as a business school or other type of school saying, all of our students will have a chance to work in, with an industry partner, or you're saying um, all of our students will have an opportunity to do a data-driven simulation. Literally, all you want is a map of all of the modules that you have, and then just easily score them. And so for us, I scored all of ours and said, okay, every module that has a chance to work with industry, I'll give a one and turn green. If it doesn't, it's a zero. And then I'll do the same for simulations. And it made me realize there's a gap. We don't actually have simulations at the right levels to fulfill the Dean's promise, which is why we started to embed um, heavily with Edmundo. And it's, it's actually a simple exercise, but it's really powerful because you start to see the gap between what you're promising to people and what you're actually delivering. And so um, that was really important. And then the next thing that we did, the next stage, which is about assessment, is we thought really carefully about assessment mapping. Because 
um, I say this with love in my heart, having worked in business schools for years, business schools do lean quite heavily on essays, reports and PowerPoint presentations. And so the other side of this was not just what's the individual assessment that matches up with the simulation we want to use. But if we look at our assessment across the piece in the, in, in the school, are we actually using a range of assessments to make sure that students develop in different ways? And so we mapped our simulations and made sure they mapped to the modules. And then we did have to do some work. It can, it, it, depending on your processes can take a while. We did think about the adjustments that we would make to assessments so they better mapped with what, what we wanted to do. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right. We, you've, you've got to make sure it does link to the assessment because otherwise it's a very practical outcome. If it doesn't, students start to think, what's the relationship between this and the assessment? I don't, I don't see what the link up is. And you do want them to see the link up between the two because that makes the simulation more powerful and students are then better prepared for the assessment because they've got more heavily involved in the simulation. No, absolutely. And that well, it just made me think that we, uh, so we held a webinar just before Christmas, uh, specifically on authentic learning. And of course, well, authentic assessment featured quite heavily in that conversation as well. And I think increasingly, whilst there's still a place for more traditional forms of assessments, like essays and exams and this sort of thing, where possible, I think, you know, universities, my, my own, feeling is that universities should be moving more towards uh, thinking around how assessments can relate more to the activities that students will be expected to do in their real world of work and that 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 coming back to graduate yeah. employment and career capital and real really sort of helping students develop those employability skills is, is crucial really yeah well if 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 i'll give a very simple example because we can make this quite complicated but i'll make it really simple fundamentally for me you as an institution or we as an institution, I want my graduates to go to a job interview. And when they're put on the spot by a graduate interviewer who says to them, OK, tell me, tell me, tell me about a project that you did. I want them to be able to talk about a project they did either with an external client or where they use real world data around simulations to be able to put into context their learning because that's really powerful in an interview situation. It's much easier for them to talk about, but it's also much more interesting for the person interviewing them. And so we still do uh, traditional essays. We still make use of traditional reports, but more and more, we're trying to make sure that there is a matchup between the theory that they, that they learn, but there is an attempt to put that in a real world context because that will help them develop in such a way that they are more successful in interviews. They are more set up with the right graduate outcomes to be successful. Because really, when a, when a student, I feel very strongly about this, when a stu student picks an institution, they're picking an institution based on the promise the institution makes. And, and I keep referring back to our dean, but our dean was really, really clear that the promises we make to students have to be front and centre on our website. So we, we have to do them. But yeah, we, it, it's... So it's not ban, ban all essays, but do think very carefully about, does this essay have purpose beyond assessment of learning? Is it also assessment of learning? And does it provide that student with the ability to have something really powerful that they can talk about in a situation where they're applying for an internship or they're applying for a graduate job? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, look, um, I suppose, It'd be good perhaps for the attendees as well, like we've already started to talk a little bit about this, but maybe to, to come back to, so it was quite a big undertaking, of course, and it was, yes. quite, it was obviously a top-down decision from, uh, from the Dean at, Sol at Salford Business School and all of the, the senior leadership team to embed, a, you know, embed simulations across the curriculum. And as you've said, Charles, you know, that, what that looks like is typically at least a simulation within every level of mm. every program, pretty much, right? So what other thoughts, I guess, do you have about, or, or advice, I suppose, or, or, or additional points to consider are there around doing so, that yeah. effectively? Yeah, so there's two different ways to do this. Obviously, one way this often happens um, in an institution, uh, an individual academic maybe teaching a module, a core module, let's say it's a large strategy module, it's got 400 people uh, thinking, how can I make this more effective? And they decide that they would like to investigate embedding a simulation. And they make a case to their school 
the school agrees with the case and pays for the simulation and that's fine and they embed it. Where we were top down is simply in the sense that we articulated a clear vision that we worked with colleagues in the school to develop. So it, was, it wasn't top down in the sense we literally just said to staff, this is what's happening. There was discussion. The, the next bit, which is really critical, is if you go on this journey, it's then saying to staff, who's going to be in the first wave? Who's going to be in the first wave of embedding simulations? Because just taking Edmundo as a partner, because they have a range of simulations, it wasn't that we started from a position of saying, well, we'll take that simulation, that simulation, that simulation, and staff just have to agree to use them. It was saying, okay, this is the range of simulations that Edmundo have. Who would like to be involved in the first wave? And if so, what simulations do you think fit? Then obviously we had to make sure there were no clashes, but that was, um, that was really powerful. And what was really powerful about it as well is I've got some colleagues and they won't mind me saying this. I had a colleague um, um, who we got involved in the first wave of simulations and he was kind of a bit, I want to try this, but what if it doesn't work? You know, what am I going to do? And we said, look, if it doesn't work, that's not your fault. That's a learning experience for us to change from. And what's really powerful, I think, about what happened to that colleague is as they got involved in the process um, and Edmundo didn't mind, he was constantly in touch with them about how can I tweak this and how can I embed this and how can I make this work? And so we were top down in terms of vision, but we, re but we really relied on staff buy-in. We were very, very clear to staff this was about them buying in and wanting to do it. And also that there was absolutely no um, problem that if a staff member ran into an issue, we would say to them, well, this is your fault. We were very clear this is a learning experience. We want to make this work. So we, we want to work together to make it work, which is, you know, which is how the dean leads the school, actually. It's really important. People can make mistakes, which is really, which is a really powerful signal to staff. Absolutely. Charles, well, you know, just in the same way that in the simulations, the students often learn the most from, from making mistakes as well, of course. Oh, um, we got some, we got a technical question. Oh. Uh, does what about the technicalities of these simulations? What infrastructure is needed? Does this work across borders for online students? What about the costs and pricing models? Uh, well, great question. Um, do, you, do you want me to answer the first bit from my perspective? Yeah, yeah, feel free, Charles. And, so, uh, so Paul, well. from, from my perspective, um, so from a technicality simulations, it's all online because, as you know, if you work in a, in a university, uh, if you work in a university, embedding anything within your own technical infrastructure is a nightmare. It is in all universities. There's all sorts of sign-offs and... Uh, we'll need agreements and security checks and blah, 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 blah. Um, from our perspective, it's been really nice and straightforward because everything is hosted by Edmundo. We don't host anything, which is fantastic. We don't require any infrastructure in the sense that we do have computer labs and we are extending the use of our computer labs. But as mentioned, students can access this from their own um, devices. And... Um, so from us, the embedding, the technical side, of the embedding is straightforward, much more straightforward than having to deal with. Um, uh, there is an organization I'm working with on something entirely different where we would have to install their software. And that is an absolute nightmare, frankly. It's all very nice, straightforward from us. There's no real technical. So we can concentrate on the um, pedagogical. The working across borders um, we have had during the COVID period students who have gone um, to home and so forth when we were teaching online and we've never had any issues about delivery with online students as it were costing and pricing models uh, I'm a customer I don't I don't I, I don't get into that well and yeah and uh, Paul will be happy to talk yeah. to you about costs and pricing models so please please get in touch with us afterwards and we'll we'll have a conversation uh, or we can provide something to you uh, yeah. on email as well. So, but fun uh, fundamentally, Paul, it does not involve, or it hasn't involved, from my perspective, lots of complicated infrastructure demands. The thing that is important, and Leon and I have done lots of conversations about this, the more important technical is about that mapping. If you're going to use lots of simulations, you have to think really carefully at the outset about if we use this simulation at level four, so in the United Kingdom first year, that does mean we can't use it at level five and six with the same group of students. So you do have to think about 
really carefully about the mapping and the student journey, because what you don't want is a student to undertake a simulation at one level, and then potentially they do an optional module at level six with the same simulation. So really a lot of it's about the mapping. And then the other side of it as well is just thinking really carefully in terms of volume. Uh, so we had to think really carefully about thinking about the overall number of licenses that we wanted. Uh, and we judged that pretty successfully. So we worked out the modules, worked out number of licenses and, and went from there. But it, it was a two-way dialogue all the way through, which has been really helpful. And Edmundo were very good. I'm, I'm going to shock some of you. Academics can be a bit slow at remind, uh, responding to emails occasionally. Edmundo have always been really good at saying, actually, we do need this bit of information. If you can supply it this week, it's really handy because we can make sure things are uh, set up. No, absolutely. And I think, Charles, just to add to that is, you know, taking that holistic view of not just the individual modules in isolation where the simulations are to be embedded, but also, as you say, thinking about the coherency across the levels of study across each programme as well. And as you say, things like making sure that the same simulation isn't, isn't done by the same students at a different level, but also more than that. So thinking about making sure that students in the next year of study go into a, a deeper level of, of, of understanding and applying the theory so that it's a perhaps a more basic simulation in at level four first yeah. year or and then and then at level six of course a more complex one um, but yeah just to so just to, just to say thanks Paul uh, for your question there and to say as well that we do have many courses that we support which are wholly online and yeah. international as well so with students in different time zones all competing online so with no physically uh, physical coming together at all yeah. so so there is another question if you don't mind I'll, I'll i'll take which i think is a really interesting one which is um rogers asked how realistic and relevant simulations how realistic do they need to be it's a good question roger and there's a couple of different answers to that so as i've mentioned we go from um level three uk level three which is basically a foundation or precursor to a degree all the way through to level seven masters. And so the simulations, uh, the, the realistic and relevance actually, you can kind of tweak upwards and downwards in the sense that our level four students, our first year undergraduates, we're trying to get them to understand core concepts. And so the, the course that's wrapped around the use of those simulations is to try to get them to understand how core concepts relate to the marketplace. When you get all the way up to level seven, when you talk about uh, realistic, what you what you can actually do, if you if you want to do this, you're not required to. You can actually use the simulations in a kind of um, metacognition way, in the sense that, or meta critique, in that you can get students to apply theoretical concepts and bring in other real world data sources from elsewhere to say, does this match up what we did expect to see in the marketplace, and um, get the students into some quite technical conversations, depending on their area, about how the simulation itself matches up to what they would expect to see in the marketplace. And so there's a question for the academic who's teaching the module or the course, as you might call it, to think about how they deal with those questions. So you can, you can from our perspective and talking to students, though, they're, they're, what I'd say is they're realistic enough. Uh, especially at, at levels four, five, and six, where our students are trying to get their heads around concepts. Okay, thanks, Charles. And um, yeah, thanks, Roger, for your question there. I'm just looking at another question from Caroline. Uh, I'm not totally sure I understand uh, your question, Caroline, but I'll, I'll try and give it a go anyway. I, th I think you're asking more about the sort of administration of... Uh, how we register the students, the details that we'll need, and how do we use that, how do we process that data um, and link it to the virtual learning environment. So those are some quite specific questions, uh, if I've understood correctly, but I'll, I'll just give it a quick uh, sort of summary now. What we tend to do is we tend to, first of course, consult with the individual module leader on exactly the number of students that you have, the size of each team, the number of markets that you'd like, and then we do all the setup for you. We'll then provide you with a, a number of login details uh, where you'll have a specific login detail for each group, uh, which you then pass on to the individual's group. In that sense, we don't need to be given the students' uh, data. So from a sort of data privacy, um, data protection viewpoint, uh, that makes it a lot easier for the university to get started. Um, 
as I say, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question yet, but um, feel free to, uh, uh, oh, having used a simulation as an embedded data set, I found it efficient to use the data easily from the LMS. So um, if I can give a slightly different answer to that, Caroline. So we use Blackboard as a platform. Uh, Black, Blackboard itself has all sorts of learning analytics in it. So what we've tended to do is we use a mixture of Obviously, Edmundo knows who's registered for the simulation on their platform. We triangulate. There's a whole different talk I can do if anybody wants to come and invite me to do it. We triangulate that with data that we get from attendance data. And also, we there's a toolkit that we use in Blackboard called Blackboard Analytics that gives us information about how they um, interact with the LMS. And the other thing tied to that is some of our upcoming simulations that we'll be using we're using the discussion platforms on Blackboard, where after each round, as part of a kind of participation, students have to write a short response to why they made their decisions. So you're actually right, because the other thing I haven't really touched upon is, if you think very carefully about this, you can think about how um, the use of the simulation in conjunction with other LMS data allows you to intervene if you want to, if you think there are any issues around attendance or engagement. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Charles, and thanks, Caroline, for your for your questions as well. Um, uh, Mir Shahid, we have a question from you. So, on a simple note, how does the trainer faculty members fit in? Is there any capacity building? Well, I think the important thing from my perspective with the simulations is, of course, that the the simulation is the opportunity for students to apply their theoretical knowledge the teaching and learning of that theory is done separately. So that's still the responsibility of the, the trainer, the, the, the teacher, the educator, lecturer, to disseminate that knowledge and to help students, or at least be the facilitator of that, that learning process. But the simulation is really where the students apply it, make those links between the theory and the practice. Uh, and of course, gain all those important employability skills as well. Yeah. I see um, Caroline's mentioned about uh, conversational student engagement. Just, just so you know, Caroline, because I think it's useful to know, we've talked mainly here about how simulations are used in the classroom. There is a whole nother conversation I'm not really going to get into, but I'm just going to put into people's minds. It does actually help you create another data set that you can use for uh, monitoring student engagement. If you are working in the United Kingdom system, student engagement attendance is a big issue because it's related to retention. So actually, sitting outside of our use of simulations, I helped develop processes in the school where we'd have regular reviews of data sets to say, what is going on with our students? Are there any trends that we need to be mindful of? And if so, what actions are we going to take? And simulations actually help to provide another data set. And we pick up as well, because we do module reviews at the end of the modules, we've got data on there about what's the what's the difference it's made to the student experience from a module perspective and what's the commentary that students have give us quality commentary about how simulations have changed their experience so yeah you can there's all sorts of ways that you can embed this into a wider conversation about how do we use this to keep on top of are we providing that really high quality experience for students Absolutely. And uh, well, if specifically on engagement as well, uh, across the whole of the institution, um, we also have a, an app as well, an engagement app called HE College Coins. So um, perhaps Caroline and everyone on the call, if that's also of interest, feel free to check that out on our, our website, edumundo.com. Um, Charles, what about success and efficacy? Oof. And thinking about like what, what metrics are you looking for so that you can not only um yeah know that this okay. is a good idea but also get 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 sort of a reassurance that you're getting value sure. so um as i've mentioned uh, i know we've got an international audience but from my perspective united kingdom in a regulated market um there's a few things that the government's really keen on one of them is progression and for government purposes progression is a student progresses all the way through their degree first time they don't need to resit any years or any of this nature they're also really worried about retention. So do students come to a university and stay at a university? And the government takes it as a bad signal if students come and drop out. So in terms of efficacy and thinking about how we measure performance, there's a few different things that we're using as measures. 
the first one is we we are doing some work doing some direct comparison between the individual modules that have simulations and comparing them year on year with previous years and we're comparing things such as um, marks average marks we're looking at submission rates what's the submission rate to previous years and also we're looking at we have a new attendance system actually at the university we're also looking at the impact potentially on attendance and what we're really trying to do is look year at year and say is there any kind of measurable performance the other thing we're really keen on is if we look at the quality of data that we collect from students in terms of uh, individual module feedback and also feedback they provide the bank programs is this helping to create an environment this is a bit more qualitative is this helping to create an exciting environment and i think it is and 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 i'm always nervous as a manager in as, as a manager in higher education we all get a little obsessed as managers in higher education with metrics right but there is another side to higher education which is like art i don't know what good art is but i know it when i see it and in the same way, um, we can measure lots and lots of things. But when you're in a school that's successful, there's a buzz. There's a buzz about the school. And there's a buzz amongst staff and students. And we're, we're quite early, early doors with our use of simulations. But it is helped to create that buzz and that sense of excitement. Um, so there's the metric side, which I've mentioned. Um, but there's also a more qualitative side and a bit of an investigation with staff and students. Because don't forget the staff side of this. For some staff, this creates a new experience for staff members. And that creates a sense of enthusiasm that then transmits to the students. So there is the metrics I've mentioned that we're looking at and we're thinking about, does it improve year on year from previous runs of modules? But don't miss out on the qualitative side, which is harder to justify to senior leaders in the institution but you know yourself if you're going to directly teach a module or if you're involved in the management of modules is really important as well no absolutely yeah so it's the numbers are important of course but it's not just the numbers it's it's the story yeah. behind the numbers as well isn't it of course. The, the numbers yeah. the only thing i'll say about numbers though so the numbers do look good because remember if you're going to get into having simulations then you're either going to build them into your yearly budget or you're going to make a yearly justification to the institution about why you need to continue to use simulations and and so for us that case looks like we'll be able to we'll be able to make that case very strongly absolutely well that's great to hear of course um by the way on your points about like those high level uh issues which of course are not just specific to business schools but to all of the faculties across mm. the university so things like uh continuation rates yeah. beyond the first six months yeah. and also progression into graduate employment those things whilst they've always been important that they're, they're only going to get more important right yeah. especially as we sort of see the outfall of things like the auger report and yes uh the, the, the proceed measures which we, we yet to fully understand how that's gonna uh look but i think yeah the, the feeling is that that's going to be quite a sort of radical shake up yeah. of certainly the system in the uk yeah i mean there is actually and this is this is absolutely nothing to do with teaching learning this is more kind of a political point there is this ongoing question in the, in the West, at least, about the value of higher education and the direction of travel in the United Kingdom, at least, is about does university and business school specifically, because I work in a business school, do we create a context and environment that makes people ready for the world of work and sets them up? And for me, simulations actually are a really good way to evidence that. And there's something actually that are translatable people outside an institution understand. So when you talk to parents and say, well, your son or daughter will be doing simulations using market data and they'll have to make decisions about how they run their company, that makes sense to people. So there is actually a slight political dimension. Yeah, yeah, OK, absolutely. Um, uh, Caroline, I can see you've, I'm not sure if that's a question or um, a comment, but... Uh, I'll take it that that's just a comment, but um, thank you for your input, Caroline. It's been great to see you're getting involved in the in the chat here. And by the way, anyone else, uh, you're more than welcome to put some questions in the chat here. So uh, we did say we'd leave some dedicated time for question and answers. Uh, but as we've already sort of received hmm. a few questions, I've just taken it that that's already happening. So please feel free to, um, yeah, to put any more questions in if anyone else would like to get involved. Okay. 
I know, Carol, Carol, I know everybody has back to back meetings these days and online has made that more uh, more prevalent. No, absolutely. And we completely understand if people need to um, to, to drop out now uh, because we're approaching yeah, an hour. So uh, 1230, then uh, yeah, please feel free. Of course, that's fine. But perhaps we'll just stay on for a couple of minutes just in sure. case yeah. uh, if that's all right with you, Charles, just to sort of see if anyone else has any uh, yeah. further questions. And um, and if, if yeah. I just I'll just make the offer as well. If anyone wants to talk to me in more detail about any aspects of that, please get in touch with Edmundo. I'm always happy to talk to people. I, I've got there's a, there's a, a question from um, Ifat Rasul here about how case study is different from simulation. Uh, perhaps I'll take that, Charles, and yeah, sure. uh, well, feel free to add as well. Yeah, that's a really good question. It's one. What, it's something I talk about a lot with academics. So I think case studies are great, and we're we're a big fan of case studies because, of course. It's about that context and relevance again to the management frameworks or you know the strategic theory. Um, but case studies can be quite difficult to put together, and you're often dealing with information which isn't wholly available in the public domain um, when it relates to a real corporation. Perhaps you don't really know what was behind all of those decisions as to why that that company made those decisions. So. I think that's one thing. So in that sense, the simulation provides all of that data for you, all ready to go. But it also goes a step further because it allows the students to be at the heart of that decision-making process and to be part of it. And in that sense, it's like a live moving case study, a real life case study. Hmm. And, and I just add to that and say, there's nothing that stops you using the two together. So you can be running a simulation, but you can also be using shorter case studies on a kind of week to week basis to try and articulate some theoretical point or other point about the market or something else that's going on the module. So we, we tend to use the two together. Uh, uh, question from uh, Dr. Jolly Sani uh, about the costs of set of games. Well, yes, we are happy to provide you with the costs. So please yeah. email us afterwards. But, uh, yeah. For, for, for us, uh, Dr. Jolly, we um, it's us. We don't, there's no additional cost to the student. We wouldn't work on that model. And, and I would say that, you know, 90, 95 percent yeah. of the relationships we have with uh, universities, it's the it's the university or college that pays. But we do have some examples where that's not possible. So we can set up, for example, a PayPal link for the, uh, the students to buy or we can make an arrangement with the bookshop where the students will mm. go there to purchase uh, their licenses as well. Yeah. I see. I see. Leon's made a comment, which I think is really important. I've oh, worked at uni Yeah, I've, I've worked at a university which prioritizes commercial awareness by mainly hiring lecturers with practical, real-world experience. I do agree with Charles that simulations do a better job at providing commercial awareness. Yeah. So for us, we have a mixture of this. So um, um, staff within the business school, quite a lot, come from a practical, real-world background. I'm heavily involved with uh, incubator space, uh, and I used to run a productivity and innovation center. So our simulations are part of an overall strategy where we try and make sure in other modules, students are getting interaction with external partners or doing internships or working with them on a, a, a project. Okay, okay, all right. Um, so I think, yeah, there's quite a few people dropping out now, but that's, that's fine. And maybe we'll sort of draw things yes. to a close. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's been an interesting uh, collaboration so far, and we're looking to obviously, yeah, to um, extending on the, the relationship and continuing to provide uh, value. Are there any sort of final thoughts, Charles, that you have about no. what we've discussed, or perhaps? No, the only the only thing I'd say to finish is just think really carefully about what you want to get out of doing this, and um, and and if you start from that basis and you start from a position of principle, which we did via our dean then actually it makes everything else much easier because you're always saying, does this fit with the core principles that we're trying to embed? Absolutely. I think that's really good advice. And perhaps from my perspective as well, just to add that whilst, of course, it was a top-down mm. uh, approach at the business school, and so it was a very high-level you know, aim and ethos to, to really embed this approach across the curriculum, across all levels. What, having said that, once we'd made that uh, agreement uh, to start, that, that was really when the hard work really started. Mm, and so, of yes. course, that wasn't a case of then, there you go, there's uh, there's 
there's a load of codes. It was, of course, then a, a whole series of individual consultations with individual academics, with module leaders, a whole series of meetings to try to um, ask questions about how it should be taught on each module, about any customizations we should make to the specific modules, thinking about the programs, but also reviewing the individual module specifications as well and how we'll match things to the certain learning outcomes. So I think whilst, of course, yes, the high level approach is great, it needs to be in conjunction still with those local uh, conversations at a module and a program level too. Yeah. Okay, well, Charles, we're delighted to have you. you. Thank you so much for your involvement with this. It's uh, been really insightful and yeah, great to hear your thoughts. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you.